Okay, back again. I'm going to change the focus a little bit for a sort of um, digression because it's going to become important in the rest of Scripture. Here you have a historical accounting. Okay. Matthew repackages what Christ said to go all the way through the next 3,220 years of history from 30 AD. So that ends up being a close from if our syllable counts are right and they're largely right but we I think there's there's still some mistakes. Um, 3250 AD. I think that total is right. Alright, I'm a little concerned about the extra seven there. But it's at least 3213. It's somewhere between 3213 and 3250. I mean 3220 in the final total is what it's going to end up being. I'm pretty sure, although it bothers me, that 3220 is the total. Alright, so that's 3250 AD. Christ is doing a historical reconciliation of time. And it's a Talmudic thing that he's doing, which, of course, most people don't bother to, you know, because Christianity is so anti-Semitic, they don't bother to look at what the Jews might have known, even though the Jews get it wrong, too. Um, when you're doing that kind of a timeline, 3,220 like 3, years, he's first doing the first 63 to get you up to the pre-church millennial that was scheduled to begin had there been no church. If Christ had been accepted, the millennium would have begun 94 AD, and we'd all not be here. Okay. But, of course, God foreknew that Christ was going to be rejected, and so Christ is basically accounting for time as a result of him being rejected. So as a result of him being rejected, there's a new 1050 that's going to start at what should have been the millennium. All right, but it isn't going to be the millennium. It's going to be a new 1050, and it's going to keep on repeating. You still don't know when the rapture is going to occur. It can occur at any time during this. But if the rapture does not occur, all this history will be there. In other words, if the rapture occurs, then this would have been truncated history or it would have still been history but history during the millennium okay but you know here we are right here okay this is where we are in history right now first curie the second recurrence of it this I have to fix okay that's wrong that's 2017 it's 2017 AD right here where we are now in history that's where we are now. Okay, well, 1993 plus 30 is, 20, is, is 2023. All right, and in 2023, we've got still all this future going on if the rapture doesn't happen. If the rapture does happen, then this whole storyline is going to be truncated or it's going to actually end up playing during the millennium because these are historical trends that the, that the Lord is forecasting. It, you know, if the rapture doesn't happen, obviously that, that would be important to know. And if the rapture does happen, it's still going to be people on earth. So how does, how does that future history play? So it's, dual, it's got a dual value, all right? Now, going back, therefore, to where we are now, This is where we are now, and there's more than 10, 50 years remaining. The rapture could happen tomorrow, in which case there's a truncation, but this history will continue for whoever's left on earth. You see the point? Whether it's the tribulation or the millennium. These are, this is going to depict how people believe or don't believe. That's the whole theory, the whole line of it. The same thing in Luke, except Luke is not covering you know he's only going to this far see Luke only ends at the at the you know 35 years he's 35 years from when the millennium was supposed to start so he tacks 35 on here so that's 1050 plus 35 that's where he stops it and he's going to 1085 for reasons I don't yet know versus 1082 here and he's mapping Christ, as you can see, as I covered ever since part one. 
in all these places and the question is why and I don't really know why altogether yet I've shown you some of the reasons I do know so these are historical summaries of the future it's just like this is how this is a commentary on life in the future how the history is going to be believing or not believing whether believers become salty or saltless Paul by contrast and he's only covering it for the first 434 years. Paul, by contrast, is telling you this is what you should be thinking during this same time period. And since this has all the language of a doxology to it, it's a sort of timeless way to think about whatever's happening to you during those times. And the specifics of what's going to happen to you are here in the histories with Luke's commentary on Matthew. But the mental attitude and the way you use doctrine is going to be playing over and over, okay, like it did in the first 434 years. That's what Paul is basically saying. Now, it might be that this 434 that Paul ends on, see, this is the end of it, Ephesians 1.14. It might be that the 434 that Paul ends on is updated for later years. And I don't know yet, but it's possible that the entire 3250 AD, okay, that's in here in Matthew, is also updated in later books of the Bible in the New Testament. I don't know yet, but it's possible. Now the reason why I say that is because Paul, all of his text has a cadence that's a march, that's kind of a marching cadence, which I didn't know until I started looking at the meter in Peter. Peter makes a marching song out of this. And then I went back and I looked at Peter and I'm like, wait a minute, he's, he's quoting this. Well, that's how he starts it, and then he turns it into a song. It's got a bum 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 kind of cadence in Peter. And so then I went back and I looked at Paul, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. This makes sense. Now, I did the videos on both Peter and Paul in Vimeo. This particular set of videos on Paul is in the Paul Meter GGS11 channel. And then in Vimeo, it's the Peter Meter channel. So that you can see what I'm talking about in more detail. I don't want to revisit all that data here. But I do want to show here that the idea with Paul is what you should be thinking as a believer looking at these periods of time. That's why this has a syrupy doxology quality to it. Because everything in history is a parallel of some prior period of history. So that's what he's doing here. Is he's showing the first 434 years from Christ's birth as a sort of template of history. And it'll just keep going over and over again. Which is exactly what Daniel says, or what the angel says, in Daniel 9.26. Okay? We're supposed to regard this, and I'm not the only one who knows this, we're supposed to regard Daniel 9.26 as a kind of time bubble. It's like Groundhog Day. It just keeps repeating itself. And that's why Paul is using 434 syllables, because, you know, 62 weeks is 364 plus 70 equals 434. So, Paul is basically saying, hi, keep this in mind as a timeless concept, and when you come across a parallel period in history to these actual years, remember the lessons that the, lead, the believers were supposed to learn then, and learn them now. Because whatever your now is, it happened before. That's what he's saying here. That's what he's doing. And here's how you know that. Or one of the reasons you know that. Look at this. You will get. And I'm going to read this from the Greek now. So watch the cadence of it. Even though my Greek is badly pronounced, you can still see the cadence. You logetos hoteos kai pater. Boom, boom, boom. And then we get on to the next line. To curiu hemon Jesu Christu. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, now watch. It's, it, the cadence changes. Now, when I first ran these two syllables together, 
I didn't know. It just I just couldn't pronounce the two so I just couldn't pronounce these two words together without writing the syllables together. So I figured that that's how somebody would speak it too, because they memorize scripture orally. I didn't know that it was a marching song till I saw Peter. So obviously, you know, I it works. That's why it works. Okay? And then you got entoi sepuranois in Christoi. Pam pam pam. And then the same um, cadence continues here. Katos ex Alexa tochemas. Pam pam pam. En otoi pro catabolis cos mu. Pam pam pam. And then it goes up again. In the Hemas Hagius Kayamomus, and that's really hysterical because this is when the temple goes down. In the Hemas Kayamomus, Katenopion Altu, and then we go back to the same old cadence. In Agape Pro Rishas Hemas. And 94 was when the millennium was supposed to start. So every new millennium you can be thinking, oh yeah, by means of love he foreordained us. So. If the rapture doesn't happen, I still go, I'm down here on earth learning him. Just as he foreordained, see? And then the cadence changes again. This is where Peter's meter comes in. That I didn't know of until I saw it in Peter. The meter completely changes here. Alright? So you could say that the whole thing ends right here. And agape pro risha se mas. So that's all the prior. That's like one verse of the song. You know, one stanza. And then we have a whole new interspersed antiphonal stanza coming in here. Because it's going to explain what are we foreordained into. Okay? So now watch. The, ch the cadence changes. Es huil te sien. Ti Jesu Christu. Oops. What happened? There we go. I clicked on the footnote. I shouldn't have. Es huil te sian. Ti Jesu Christu. Es aton kata. Ten yudokian. Tu telematos autu. Es se painon. Tosis is haritus autu. Ese haretos en gemas en tu agapa menoe. En oe echomen ten apolutrosen. Ti etojamatos jautu ten afeisin ton paraptomaton. Cata tu plutas te es haretos autu. And then it stops there. And then the cadence changes again. All right, and I don't know why. See, the thing that's so unique about this text is that you can read it backwards or forwards. I can assign this clause right here to everything backwards as an explanatory. I can also use it going forward as an introductory for the standard of his riches with which grace he superabounds by means of all reason and thought. In other words, this could be the first sentence in a new paragraph or it could be the last sentence in the previous paragraph. That's why it's so hard to remember and it sounds so sleepy and syrupy when you read it in English. But you see, it doesn't have that sound to it in, in the Greek. Katato plutas teis charitos atu. Katato plutas teis charitos atu. You could be doing it like that. Tena sin. Don paraptomaton. It's got punch. It's got a marching punch to it. See, it's it's got rhythm. Es non dosis es charitus auto, and then you're waiting for something to close it. Es charitos en gemas, so it's not really closing. En tagapamenoi, enoi ekomen ten apolutrosen tietu haimatus auto, going up again. And it's still not ending. Tena feisin ton paraptomaton katato plutas tes haritus autu and it still doesn't close. And that's what's getting me about this. It's like they keep on creating cliffhanger cadence from it. And Peter's meter agrees 
is, is interfacing with the somewhere, I'm not sure quite where, but starting in here at a squeal to sin, di Jesu Christu. And the reason I know that is Peter has a phrase in in his stuff that's a serpido susan, design dianostaseos, Jesu Christu et necron. Okay, and in English it's translated to a living hope of the resurrection. Jesus Christ from among the dead ones. So you don't get the punch, you don't get the march, you don't get the enthusiasm that's actually in the Greek. See, th think of that. Esuiotesian, di Jesu Christu. And then Peter's reply is, Esuiotesosandi, Anastaseos, Jesu Christu et Necron. See, it fits with this cadence here in Paul. And of course, Peter started his whole chant, his march, with Ulogetas Hokteos Kaipater. So he's folding in what he says somehow into this Pauline text. Now why does that matter? Because if the Pauline text is a commentary on Matthew, how you should think about these years when you go through them, because you're getting the data about what the years are going to be like from Matthew, and update on the data from Luke, that's the data. But what do you do with it? Here's what you do with it. <coughs> you march. Okay, and I'm going to have to march because my I'm coughing too much. Okay, back again. I got a cough drop this time. I want you to see. See, here's Peter. And this is all, these are all first drafts. I haven't had time to, you know, really go back through them. See, this is First Peter 1, 3. Right there. See, same text. That's what's in Paul right here. Let me move that. See? So Peter is, it starts out by quoting Paul. And then there ends up being a sort of cadence to all this. And then here's the phrase I was saying in the last increment. Okay? So, There's your first 20 syllables that Peter's quoting in Paul. Paul in the lower window. Ho katato polau tu eleos anaskinesas hemas. Ho katato, I don't remember how that meter goes. I'm, you know, ho katato polau tu eleos anaskinesas hemas, or something like that. But this one, because my tongue was tied when I kept trying to say it, finally the meter just hit me. I said, Peter Zosandi, Anastasius, Jesu Christu, Necron. So he's deliberately linking it to Paul's meter here. It's very bald. Exactly where he's doing that, I don't know. The, the closest meter sound I got to it is right down here in Paul. And then it makes sense to then say as a refrain, But maybe that's not true. Okay, you put it where you want, and then he goes on. And Peter's meter goes all the way to four. See, see, here's his four thirty-four to match Paul, and it's an eighty-four difference because Paul prefaces his statement with a fifty-six, so Peter prefaces his with an eighty-four. Okay, so he's essentially using two eighty-fours. Ha ha, see I'm playing the same game as Paul. By the time I get to 434, it's also an 84 rather than 91. I'm not sure why he's doing that. And then he ends it with a 49 in diaspora at 483. Why is he doing that? I don't know. I haven't worked all this out in Peter yet. But what you can see, it should be obvious, you know, just looking at it. Wait a minute. See, there's this is his prologue to enter. And he's dating it back by the temple also. Is that he's playing a game with Paul's meter. 
What game? Where? I don't know. It's just obvious that he's doing that. Okay, and the cadence that most matches is right here at verse 5 in Paul. But the text where he begins showing that he's doing that is right here in Paul. Now, the question is, is Peter interlacing and adding extra verses, as it were, to the marching song? Does that, therefore, go back to and comment on Matthew and Luke? The answer is probably yes. How? I don't know. So that's what I wanted to add to this increment.